And Charlie, do you want uh, questions during or after? If or anyone has questions during, uh, please feel okay. free to interrupt and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. And I could always put the slides back up and go through them. And I just, again, so that's fine. And again, Paul, thank you for the, the mm -hmm. kind introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready to go. All right, let me share my screen. And again, I appreciate uh, everybody joining us this evening. And I'm going to take you on a little journey uh, into an area and a topic that I enjoy, uh, and I hope you will enjoy it as well. I try to combine a little bit of history with a little bit of postal history and a little bit of stamps, uh, and, uh, and I really do enjoy and have fun going down this path. And I hope you can see my first slide. Um, and this evening, I'm going to talk, I'll give you a little brief history of T. Kensett uh, and company, uh, food packers. Um, manufacturers as well of, of tinware. And then I'm also going to talk about the U.S. private diet proprietary canned fruit revenue stamp that they briefly issued in 1867. This stamp literally was out less than two months when the tax was repealed. So it had an amazingly short life, hence why there were very few that are available, even from the limited production run. At the upper left on the slide, you'll see Thomas Kensett II, We'll talk a little bit about him and his family and his father. In the middle there, you see a, uh, an advertisement for Thomas Kenzet & Co. Uh, and their manufactured uh, stamped plain in J Japan tinware. Even at the upper right is a, an old wooden crate. We'll talk a little bit about oysters. We'll talk a little bit about Maryland and the Chesapeake tonight. Um, we'll talk about New York. Uh, so I'll kind of take you on a little bit of a journey uh, for that beautiful green stamp that you see there on the title page, uh, which is the recent find of mine from earlier this year, uh, kind of repatriated this pretty little revenue from the United Kingdom back here to the U.S. And uh, it is really just a beautiful stamp in this very deep green uh, T. Kensett & Co., Baltimore, Maryland, with a central image of a basket of fruit and some maize below, peaches and watermelon. And we'll dive in and talk a bit about that. And the other thing that this really led me down the path was to kind of revisit the known copies that are out there uh, and that have been known to be out there. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the 1994 census that was published by Mike Aldrich, Aldrich a very well-known uh, revenue collector, dealer, aficionado, expert in this space. And I've been updating that census for the past, what, six months now, and I'll sort of talk about the census as well, in addition to giving you a little history. So let me go to the next slide and I'll give you an overview. So here's kind of what I want to discuss this evening. I want to give you a little bit of an introduction to Kenzin and Company, their early years when they were founded in New York City and, uh, and then those years there. Uh, and then their move and expansion to Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and really that was where they prospered and they grew their business. Uh, I'll take you on a short pictorial history of oyster and fruit packing industry. Uh, it's amazing what one can find now on the World Wide Web if one searches. Uh, uh, there is so much information out there about just about any company or proprietor you're looking for. We'll then move into the short-lived canned goods tax uh, and stamp. Um, we'll talk about that RP1A, uh, which after you see the census, I think, and I believe is the finest extant. Talk a little bit about just the preparations of how you make a stamp and trial color proofs and, and whatnot, even additional proprietary revenue stamps that the company used during that period before they issued their own stamp. Uh, this was common during that period as well, uh, before the private die proprietaries were created. A uh, number of different companies utilized the existing revenue stamps that were issued and just put a hand stamp on them. And then we will dive into a high level sort of revisiting the census. Um, I will show you the montage. There is a small image of the montage of what I have currently been able to, you know, from an image perspective, show and find and identify. Uh, and there are a number of folks to thank with respect to putting that together. But again, looking on the internet at various prior auctions and catalogs, you can find quite a bit of information. And then I'll summarize it and then have a call to action. Uh, all of what I'm going to present to you tonight, I've started to write up for an article, uh, which will be in the American Revenue down the road, um, hopefully by the end of this year, early next. And this is the first foray of presenting this uh, in this format. Uh, but I have started to write this up. I, I think it's just a really neat story. Um, and hopefully you will agree as we go to the next slide. So where do we begin? 
let's talk about Kenzit. Who were they? Who was Thomas Kenzit uh, and the company that he created and founded that, you know, his sons and grandsons continued? And so here on slide one is Thomas Kenzit in 1786, 1829, was an Englishman born in Hampton Court. He was an engraver. He emigrated to the U U.S. Uh, he settled in New Haven, Connecticut, on or before 1806. He began, began canning food in New York City about 1810, very shortly after arriving. Uh, and his son and namesake were one of the first to process fresh co cove oysters. I do love oysters. So this is also a great story. Uh, any kind of shellfish. Spent plenty of time in Baltimore in the Inner Harbor. Uh, and so, again, uh, I really do enjoy this story and what Thomas Kensett was able to do. Uh, they began that process in 1849. And they call them Cove because of Cove Street, a lane down in Baltimore where several oyster houses were located. Um, they were just one of many. But they do have some prominence in this space with respect to canning and tin and uh, vessels of tin, as they were called. But a little history on the family. So Kenton married uh, uh, Elizabeth Daggett, and she was the sister of the, and many of you might know, he was a banknote engraver, Alfred Daggett. And you can find uh, a number of banknotes that Alfred uh, engraved during this period, uh, a pretty prominent individual. Um, and then Kenzit uh, had their first child, uh, Thomas Kenzit II. Uh, he will, we'll talk about him later because he will go on to really expand and grow the company. Uh, but the senior, the father went into partnership with the father-in-law Ezra Daggett in New York City. They processed salmon, lobster, oysters. They had them in glass containers. Not a great decision, as, as you might expect. It was expensive for glass and they were prone to breakage. Uh, they had to come up with a better approach, a better way uh, to house these. And in 1825, Kenzit and Daggett were awarded a U.S. patent for preserving food in vessels of tin. And again, doing some searching, if you look there on the right, uh, there is a tin of fresh cove oysters packed by T. Kenzit. Uh, that was found uh, uh, in a wreck. And you could see it. There is the tin. It has the name on it, Cove Oysters, packed by, you could see the name across the middle, Thomas Kenzit, uh, 122. And there's the address below. And so that really uh, was a, a very big, that was a, pro, that was a turning point for them from a company perspective and just for the business in general, being able to move from glass containers to tin containers to be able to store and then ship, uh, you know, uh, their wares. Uh, you know, in 1825, right about then, Daggett retired. The senior continued the business until his debt passing in 29. And again, like I said earlier, the son really then, then, then took over uh, and grew the company. Let's go to the next slide. So, and my mouse is acting up. Here we go. So let's talk about their years after New York City in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, in 1849, Thomas Kensett, who was the son of the founder, and there his picture is there, a Getty image there on the right, um, expanded. He partnered with brother-in-law Wheeler, and they went to New York, they took the New York City company and, and went to Baltimore, Maryland. They had far greater facilities for procuring oysters and fruits. Uh, a little bit later, I'll show you some pictures um, of their establishment. They built quite large plants, canning plant, on York Street near Light Street, if you know Baltimore and downtown, and I will show you a map, it is right there on the Inner Harbor. Uh, they had two factories, uh, one for packing fruits, the other for manufacturing the tin canisters or cans. Um, and that was, you know, their business for, you know, hermetically sealing oysters and fruits was growing dramatically during this period in the late 1840s, early 1850s. Uh, before the Civil War, the company processed large quantities of oysters, fruits, mostly peaches, uh, some of which you saw a little bit on their stamp, uh, and then vegetables as well, corn and peas and tomatoes. You also saw some vegetables on that stamp I showed you too. Um, and in 57, Wheeler passed and Thomas continued to run the business alone. And then his son, uh, Kensett, Thomas H. Kensett. So we've got three Thomases here passing from grandfather, father, son, and the nephew Vale took control. Here on this slide, I show you a very pretty at the lower left, uh, uh, Imperial brand Fresh Cove Oysters can label that they printed and put on their cans from Kenzit & Co. Uh, a little bit of a later period. Uh, they were, like I said, successful for many years. They even had their own Packers token 
this is circa 1865. I have a number of these. That is one of mine. I have a few more in front of me now. Uh, they issued those trade tokens. It has the same image on both sides. Uh, and it says Kensit with some fancy design above and below. And there's just a representative ad that they would have placed in a number of the local papers, not just in Baltimore, but beyond. This is from 1850. And you could see Thomas Kensit and Co. It was Kensit and Wheeler at the time. Again, their stamp plane, Japan Tinware, uh, a dealer in hermetically sealed oysters, fruits, et cetera, on West Falls. Um, so let's, so let's talk about the area that we're concerned with here, just to put this in perspective of, of where are we. So here I am. Here I am in Lancaster. I circled it. That's the city of Lancaster here. We mostly are. There's the Susquehanna River coming down uh, into the Chesapeake Bay, going all the way down to the Atlantic. So here's Pennsylvania, Mason-Dixon. Here is a map of Baltimore with the city of Baltimore circled. Here is the lower region of the county, uh, Somerset uh, of Maryland on the Chesapeake, another area we'll talk about where many oyster houses were here in this area of the lowlands on these plains. Uh, we'll talk about Crisfield a little bit and just highlighted some of these areas. Uh, here, a circle at the upper right is York, and here is Light on the inner harbor of Baltimore. They had two factories here on York where it crosses with Light. I actually will show you some images and pictures of that. Uh, they were a very successful business doing very well. And we're going to get to, you know, they eventually printed their own stamp. Uh, and so I show you here where that particular stamp is today. And we're going to dive into the history uh, of the company. Uh, and I'm going to take you on a little pictorial just to orientate us to the region that we're talking about. So let's go to the next slide. So again, searching, uh, you know, uh, I don't have to go and search through, you know, microfiche like we used to have to do again, uh, way back when, you know, you do a little searching online and it's again amazing what you're able to find. And here at the upper left, and that's why I mess, uh, mentioned Chrisfield, is uh, oyster houses again along the shore. And look at the piles of oyster shells, millions and millions of oyster shells. And amazingly, uh, uh, a uh, very large business, profitable, productive business, feeding as many people as you can in their in their new tin cans uh, and shipping those uh, uh, far and wide. Uh, a picture at the lower left, the Baltimore Packing House in March of 1872 that appeared in Harper's Weekly of, of young ladies uh, in the room here shucking. Uh, and so a picture at the lower right of an oyster shucking knife. Uh, found out in Crisfield from that year in the early 1900s, uh, you know, handheld. Uh, and you can see the sharp little point at the end, which was just flat enough to be able to get it into that oyster and, uh, and, and open up that shell and remove. Uh, and at the upper right is the Thomas Kensit and Company Oyster and Fruit Packers factory, three-story building. Uh, this is circa 1861-62. Uh, and it's a great photo. I cropped it a bit to get it on this page. It's, it's actually a bit larger to the right. Uh, and it shows their second factory. It shows the inner harbor. It shows a tall masted ship. It shows piles of shells as well. Um, but I just wanted to show at least the company. Quite prosperous down here. And the next slide will show a little bit of a blow up here at the upper right of a couple of horse and wagons. Uh, and the picture at the right of a Kensit man with a box of oysters, he is holding that in his hand, a wooden crate. Here at the lower right, again, is uh, another Kensit man uh, with multiple crates of unlabeled oysters on this, uh, on this horse and, and, and cart getting ready to move. And you can see a couple of gentlemen in the back. Uh, we can speculate who they are, uh, you know, with a very tall top hat dressed in garb of the period. Even this young fella here looks to be uh, almost in a soldier garb too, looking at his hat uh, and his high boots and his pants uh, on the back uh, of, a, uh, of a carriage. At the upper left, talk about oysters and hermetically sealing and crating them. Uh, here is a crate of fresh cove oysters and tin cans. While it is not from Kensit, but it's from Price and Little, you'll see that name. It still is cove oysters from Baltimore. This is what these crates and and packages would have looked like. Here are what the cans would have looked like close up, whether oysters were in them uh, or fruit were in them or vegetables. This is really what those cans would have looked like um, during this period. This was a discovery 
and this is illustrated from Treasure in a Cornfield by Greg Hawley, uh, they discovered and excavated a steamboat Arabia sunk in the Missouri River in 1856. So from this period, um, and this was published, uh, Kansas City Paddleville published in 2005, and it's a great image from this era of what these crates and these cans looked like. So now just picture one of our stamps, you know, on top of one of these cans paying that tax, which, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Again, here is that ad I showed earlier on the front page. Um, just again, an advertisement from this period uh, that they and many other companies who are in this business uh, were promoting uh, their tinware as well as their vegetables uh, and their oysters and their fruits. So that's a little walk through the history of kind of the business of Thomas Kensett and Co and their canned goods uh, uh, and then the impact that they had uh, in Baltimore and the industry at hard in just patenting uh, you know uh, these uh, these tin vessels. I want to move briefly to the short-lived canned goods tax um, uh, and the stamp that they issued. Uh, we talked in the past about, during this period, the tax that was issued by the government to, at the beginning of the, uh, of the Civil War to help fund the Civil War that lived on for many years following uh, to generate revenue. And items such as medicines and matches and playing cards and perfumes were all taxed uh, during this period uh, to generate millions and millions of dollars for the effort. And then, you know, following the end of the war, the reconstruction as well. Um, and all of these products were taxed. And for a very short amount of time, literally a few months, uh, canned goods were taxed. And the next slide will kind of go into that. And so this tax on canned goods, uh, and I've got that listed at the top, began on October 1st in 1866. For each can, bottle, or other package, for each two pounds weight or fraction thereof, one cent. So one penny was required, one cent tax was required. Uh, again, and Kensett was the only canned fruit proprietor to issue a stamp in January of 1867. I think it was on... January 3rd, and I think I denoted that below. And only less than two months later, on March 1st, 1867, meats, shellfish, fruits, and vegetables became exempt from that tax. Uh, and so they were the only ones to issue it. It lasted less than two months. They issued this stamp, and then they did not need it anymore. Um, let me remind you that the tax on all of those other areas and items continued for many years up until the 1880s on, on uh, our elixirs and nostrums, those medicines that you know I presented in the past, playing cards, uh, perfumes, uh, as well as matches. So those taxes stayed firm, but this tax went away. Uh, and so here, here's this beautiful stamp. It is denoted in the Scott catalog uh, in the private die proprietary section in the back of your book is RP1A. There is only one RP stamp and this is it. You know, the medicines are denoted as R for revenue S, the matches are ROs, the, perf the perfumes are RTs, and the playing cards are RUs. And this is the only one that is uh, a canned fruit stamp. Uh, and again, I, uh, it is a beautiful stamp, one cent green, deep green. Um, this die was approved on December 4th, 1866. It was uh, engraved and printed by uh, Butler and Carpenter out of Philadelphia. Uh, as I said before, it was issued January 3rd, 67. These came in sheets of 210 stamps per sheet. This stamp is the size of a typical definitive stamp. So pick a, you know, a Wash Franklin and turn it on its side. This is about the size of a Wash Franklin, Washington Franklin. Uh, and again, it was last issued on March 7th. Um, they only issued 528,000 of these on old paper. As uh, many of you know, revenue stamps from this era were printed on different types of paper, old paper, silk paper, pink paper, watermark paper. But this stamp printed at this period, 1867, was only printed on old paper. Um, and again, very limited quantity. Um, and that's hence why very few survive. Um, because they were also pulled within two months. Uh, the designs, like I said before, large basket of fruit, more on the shaded ground, colorless uh, rectangle, beautiful arch top, 
uh, with the company name above and Baltimore, Maryland below. Um, really uh, just pretty florets all around. One cent as well. All of these stamps had U.S. Internal Revenue proprietary. They were official issued stamps to pay the tax. Uh, and you'll see the colorless numeral one at the upper right, upper left, because that was what the tax would have been and was. Uh, and so again, uh, most of this data you could find, and you'll you'll see references peppered throughout where um, you know, when I refer to some of the facts, this comes from the, the very famous Boston book as we refer to, that was uh, by Topin, Dietz, and Holland, published in 1899. This is really that historical reference that if you're inter interested in U.S. revenues uh, of all types, this is sort of the book to go to. Gives a lot of background and detail uh, on the companies, what was printed, when it was printed, the paper it was printed on, all of that. So let's dive a little bit more now that we've talked about the stamp and the stamp that was issued. You know, let's just look at this particular stamp that I was really fortunate to be able to acquire back, I think it was January 2nd of this year. Uh, and it was overseas in the UK. And uh, uh, and then I saw it and uh, I really kind of fell in love with it uh, as a, you know, diehard match of medicine revenue aficionado. Here is the front and the reverse uh, on the right. Uh, it's a very clean stamp. You know from prior talks that I have given and others, you know, all of these stamps, the proprietary stamps, were used on products. They were really meant to be ripped, torn, teared apart uh, in half when the box or the bottle uh, or the container was opened. They were really utilitarian in that respect, and they are very often damaged. And every once in a while, you come across one, especially in this case, with this stamp that is in pretty exceptional condition. Um, it is, you know, for these stamps, and I will, I will show you what others look like. Uh, on the left, I'm holding it up to a light just to backlight it to show you the stamp. Really a nice margins all around, good purse, pretty clean. Um, and there's a tiny little rust spot there just above the sea of scent. Um, and you'll see from other stamps that I will show you, and I alluded to, these were used on tin cans and these tin cans rusted. And if these stamps were on those cans and they were found at a later date, you will find rust spots and stains on a lot of these stamps because how they were used. Um, and there at the lower right, as I allude to the Aldrich census of 1994, at that time, 27 were known in the census that he put together in 94. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And 20 plus of them were, were, were damaged, tears, thins, repairs, all of that good stuff in, in addition to rust stains. So, you know, uh, finding this really one piqued my interest in, in really looking at the, you know, the historical record of what was out there of prior stamps. And of course, learning the history. Uh, there's very limited information that was available out there. There's one short article that was published many years ago in the American Revenue on Kensit, uh, but nothing uh, I think is substantial is what I'm showing you here. So um, I hopefully we've added some new information to this, to the company, the history and the stamp. Let's move to the next slide now that I've shown you the stamp in a little bit more detail. And I wanna now go back because that was the, that was the official stamp that was issued, that was printed in a half a million or so copies. But as many of you know, before you go and print stamps up, you, you need to engrave, you need to design it, you need to engrave a die, you need to put it on a transfer roll, uh, and you need to make sure that it gets approved by the proprietor, whomever is going to be purchasing it. Uh, and so you go through what are called, you know, uh, uh, proofs or trials. Uh, and this is one of those examples. And just to remind you, you know, proofs are examples of the finished die that are ultimately issued. Um, and they're printed not on stamp paper. They're printed on India or card or bond. Uh, and they can be made from the die or the plate. Uh, and they can be made in the same color that you're going to issue the stamp in, or they can be, you know, a range of colors. colors. Uh, sometimes they're issued in four or five or six colors to give the the proprietor or the purchaser the idea to look at various colors to make a final decision of maybe what color they would like their stamp to be. Uh, and here is, you know, one such example, uh, and it is the only known example. This is the unique trial color proof of RP1. It is referred to as, you know, TC for trial color one. It is in black, um, and it was pulled by Butler and Carpenter. And this is the only one that has survived. 
um, and this area has been studied for quite some time, going back to, you know, Joyce et al. and many other students of matching medicines, in addition to some of the other folks that I'll mention later on, like Mike Aldrich and Eric Jackson uh, and Richard Friedberg and others. Um, this was approved, as I said earlier, on, the, on December 4th, 66. The stamp was issued in January 3rd. So sometime, you know, when the die was approved uh, between December and January, this was pulled and was printed out. Uh, you can see it is on India paper. I, back, I backlit the image on the right. Uh, it is uh, 65 by 54 millimeters. That's the entire uh, piece that has survived. There was a little bit of indentation around, if you look at the upper left, where you can see it was impressed. That is known as die sinkage. That's the pressure of pushing the die uh, onto this India paper on the press, which is dampened in the paper. Um, but they held a contract to produce private die proprietaries from 62 to 75. They produced most of the pro private die proprietaries that we see uh, today. Eventually it moved to, you know, the National Banknote Company, et cetera. Um, this is a really nice piece. Again, I was very fortunate to be able to add this to the issued stamp that I just showed you on the page before. Uh, and I have to call out Richard here. Uh, Richard and I talked quite a bit about this and other, Richard Friedberg, about these and other match of medicines in detail. And he really, a number of years ago, put out a collector's handbook for private die proprietary proofs and a census of the Morton Dean Joyce collection of these issues. Uh, you know, Morton Dean Joyce, uh, as he was affectionately called, was the dean, quote unquote, of Matcha Medicines. Uh, and he had really amassed, uh, you know, the collection of all the known, uh, even some of the drawings, the approvals, uh, just, just all the trial colors, the proofs, the essays, and then the issued stamps, some of which, as you know, from prior talks are quite rare where in some cases one or two are known. Um, and Richard, as well as Eric and Mike Aldrich and Eric Jackson were involved uh, in sort of the sale of that and have really nice write-ups uh, in, in the book, uh, the Joyce book, the sale book. Uh, but he put this little monograph out or handbook and in it, he did at the time an inventory of all of those known that were in Morton's collection. And uh, if you look on page 16 of that monograph, if you have access to it, and if anybody needs it, I'm happy to share it. Uh, there is only one trial color proof in black that was uh, released from uh, B and C, Butler and Carpenter. There is two from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and also one that we're not sure of uh, that's also a trial color. So just really nice to see the progression. This is really clean. You can see in this trial color what the stamp was meant to look like. Uh, and then I showed you on the slide before what the printed stamp looks like. And, you know, when you have an exceptional copy, you can see the details in really uh, in high relief. Now we'll go back another step. And I alluded to earlier, before many of these proprietors issued their own stamps, um, they utilized, and this stamp should look familiar to many of you, this is a general issue U.S. revenue one cent proprietary stamp. Um, and it is R3C, perforated. And they utilized this stamp for a number of years uh, before they uh, went and issued their own. And these are care of Mike Morrissey, uh, who, you know, these are provisionals. And you can see TK and company at the top, October 1866, three lines, you know, reading across. And there are two types of this known, and you'll see below. T. Kensit and Co. Baltimore period. And this is that second type as well. Uh, vertical reading up, uh, and this one is undated. And so they issued those for a number of years prior uh, until 1867 when they had the opportunity to then design and issue their own stamp that would truly represent, you know, what they were peddling, what their wares were, which again was part of, you know, the uniqueness of this period is uh, that the private die proprietary stamps really were uh, a marketing, they did pay the tax but they were you know, utilized as marketing and advertising, if you will, of, of the products that, that, that they were selling, whether it was the medicines, uh, the private dye, you know, the, the playing cards, the perfumes, um, as I've shared in the past and, uh, and I will share again in the future. On the right, and this is care of Dan Harding, uh, they also had their own CDS, circular date stamp or double stamp, if you like, uh, this, this hand cancel, uh, where on this particular document, 
uh, which it should not have been used on. So it was used improperly as a documentary revenue stamp. It is canceled by a black double circle, Thomas Kensington Co., December 30th, 1867, Baltimore. Um, interesting the date there because, you know, we know when they had their die approved for their own stamp and yet they use this pair on this particular document uh, to improperly pay. Um, so just wanted to show you a couple of other examples uh, of what was out there before they actually issued their stamp. So now that we've talked about the stamp and we've shown that they, what they issued, that they used, uh, you know, uh, provisionals for a bit, then they issued their own stamp. Uh, you know, this again piqued my interest to go back and look at, you know, the, the known copies that were out there. Uh, you know, finding a copy, and it's very fortunate when you can, that's in really good condition, just really made me want to go back and look at, you know, what, what else was out there, what was available to collectors, what was known in 94, and then what we might be able to identify today. Um, you know, these don't come up on the market very often, and when they do, you know, um, there are many individuals usually looking at them to fill that one space on the one page in your album, because it's the only stamp that was issued, that's a canned fruit stamp. So I'll, I'll, I'll revisit the census. I'll go through a montage of the known examples. Uh, and I've given you a little teaser there. I've taken what was known from 94, which was the number of 27 at the time, uh, to currently adding 12 more examples to the 2022 census. And I am currently up to 39. Uh, and then I will go through, not in detail, but I have individual digital images of the known examples, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So revisiting the census of known copies. So here is that, you know, the new copy that I recently acquired earlier this year, which piqued my interest in the company, in the history, and then in the census. You know, and this has definitely been one of the more popular revenue stamps due to its design. Pretty unique, limited quantity of issue, just over half a mil. It's narrow use over barely two months in 1867 from, you know, January to March. And then the tax was pulled, you know, on March 1st, 67. So, so, so very little use. Um, and a shout out to Mike Aldrich. You know, in 97, he published his seminal work entitled, you know, A Census of U.S. Match of Medicine Stamps. And there's a, the, the cover with the, uh, the wrapper on it. Uh, uh, and this was multiple years in the making because he started this in the early 90s, really 94, give or take, 95. And, you know, uh, and he built upon earlier census that were done in 34 and then again in 87. Uh, and, you know, with uh, Morton Dean Joyce's collection coming on the market as well, there was an explosion uh, of, of all sorts of new items that he was also able to add to the census, which then led to this work. And and there's always a caveat with any census. It's only as good at, at the time that you did the census. And it's only as good of how broad you communicated that you're doing a census. And it's only as good as the individuals that want to share with you that they might have an item that you're looking for if you're doing a census. And so those are always the caveats. But at least it gives you a starting point. It gives you some sort of baseline to kind of get a feel for rarity or scarcity uh, and what is out there. Uh, and this covered all sorts of paper types and all of the match of medicines. Uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. So the 1994 census consists of 227 items um, and with a full population of 4,630 private type proprietary stamps. It really was pretty comprehensive looking at the less common, if you will, types of match and medicine and perfume and playing card and, of course, RP1. The, the canned fruit stamp, uh, which is, again, you know, are issued on many different types of paper, old, pink, silk, experimental silk, watermarked. Some of those paper types are extremely rare and hard to find. Um, and so, you know, kind of sets the stage for understanding, uh, you know, what is out there, what might be out there. And as we're all aware, this kind of drives the, the, the value, the supply and demand in the market space. And at that time, only 27 known copies of RP1A were available to collectors, where easily over 20 of them existed very faulty, if not all of them, have something wrong with them, even if you look at those 27. Um, you know, the quality is quite poor. They were used on steel cans of canned fruit. They were often torn off. If you're lucky to be down in Baltimore in a harbor and you come across an old factory or a garage, you might come across an old can of fruit and it might have the stamp on it. 
uh, as collectors way back when would do or any other products. And you might not keep the can, but you might take the stamp off and you might be okay with that, uh, even if it was torn a little bit or it had some thins uh, and it absolutely had rust stain. Then you were going to see that. So my recent discovery, uh, you know, really wanted me to go down and revisit the census, you know, and I, there's a number of folks I will thank at the end and some are on this call tonight, uh, but I'll make sure to acknowledge them at the end. And I really wanted to attempt to locate digital images of all. In this modern era, um, you know, with various auctions, auction catalogs, our ability, you know, to scan what we have and or share from various exhibits and exhibitions, um, there's quite a bit of digital images that are out there. Uh, and you're, it's always amazing when I reach out to friends and collectors and colleagues who are willing to share. Some are Monomain Anonymous, others want to have no problem sharing with you. And if anything is already uh, on a website for, for example, on a Siegel auction, it's available, you know, you're able to see that image. You're even able to see when it's sold and for what it's sold for. Uh, and you'll see that I give credit where credit's due throughout the census here. And so as of today, I've identified 39. So we've increased that census by 12, which is pretty significant. If you're talking about, you know, one, it's still a very uncommon stamp. You know, if anybody's interested in the cat value, I'm happy to tell you later. It is there. It's published. It's in Scott. Value, again, is, you know, in the Baha'i of the beholder on a number of different approaches, but there, there is a value to it. Um, and what, rep what I'm going to show you next represents the best digital images that I at least could obtain on the internet or from colleagues. And then at the end, I'll have a little call to action. Um, but let's kind of go through what these look like. Here on one page uh, are all 39 that are currently known. And so there's one that I only have a black and white image of, and that's number one at the top. I, I, these have no specific rhyme or reason for ordering them or numbering them. Um, you know, I, I put the one that I have in my position there at the bottom in the center there, number 39. And then it's everything prior is just over the past months as I was able to discover and uncover them and or have individuals send images to me um, to be able to show. But putting them this way and creating a montage, and I'm going to give Keith, who's on the line here, Thompson, some credit, um, because he kind of put it in, in these words. Putting a montage together like this puts a face on the phrase when we say most are faulty, right? So often attached to many private die proprietary stamps. There is a section at the beginning of Scott's catalog that describes this. There is a note that makes mention of because of how these were used. These are quite different than other postage stamps, our general issue stamps, our air mail stamps, uh, uh, many other stamps that we all collect. Um, these revenues hold a different place because of how they were used on products and were meant to be ripped. They were put where the seal was. They were put on the cap of the bottle. So when you broke the seal, the stamp was broken, paid the tax, it marketed and advertised, and it was destroyed. But of course, those that survive are why we're here. Uh, and in effect, if you look at all of these images and you scan them closely, and I know it's small, but I have larger images, um, you know, to share, Almost all of these copies are faulty uh, to some extent. Um, and I'll say less than number 39, I think that most recent discovery. Where that was hiding for the past, you know, 150, 160 years, it was really well taken care of. Uh, and suffice to say, it will continue to be well taken care of and preserved in the way that it is today. So I'm not going to go through each one of them, but I at least want to show you in a little bit larger kind of what they look like. And you'll see as we go through this, and here's just one representative, the first six, you'll see tears. If you look at the lower middle stamp, you'll see these rust marks and stains because of the cans that they were on and then they were found, they were removed. Uh, you'll see all sorts of other tears and damages, rips and perforations, scrapes on the surface. You'll see off centering. So these also, you know, like, many stamps of this era were not all printed perfectly gem-centered of the many panes that were issued of the 528,000 stamps that were issued. Look at the stamp at the lower left. That is, is rusted. It's got a little bit of a hole. It's off center. Uh, it's kissing the upper and the left side. Um, this is just how you find them out there. Um, again, because of their use. 
and their limited print. I'll go to the next few again, just to show you. Again, you'll see variations again. Of course, with each one of these, and I'm not stopping to show you, below each one, I sort of have a date. I have where I saw it or where I found it and where it was sold, maybe the sale number, the lot number, how much it sold for. You can see some of these have sold for thousands of dollars. Others have sold for in the five to six to 700 or even less. Depends on the day, depends on the auction, depends on who's in the, in, in, in the audience. Uh, there's a lot of things, as you're all aware, that go into this. But suffice to say, usually very popular when this stamp comes on the market. Um, I will keep going. Some of the images are blurry. These are the best images that I can obtain. They are out there somewhere. A number of these have been certified. The ones at the bottom three, you'll see have PFC. So, you know, Philatelic Foundation certificates, and there they are. Um, you know, uh, the one at the upper right looks like it was put in a vacuum and then taken out of the bag, but there it is. And it still is a pretty stamp uh, because it's the only canned fruit stamp. And so uh, uh, it kind of it tells the story. The upper left stamp, again, quite damaged. The upper right one. Look at the rust stains on the middle one in the center. Um, again, this was on a tin can and it rusted and it was found and it was removed. Uh, really hard to get rust off of this type of paper. It's just not something that comes out. Some of these are in pretty decent shape though. You know, this is not bad. Good centering, pretty good. A little bit of a tear at the top, rough purse. You know, that's one of the better looking ones. Uh, let's keep going. Here are some nicer ones, not so bad here. One at the lower left, pretty good shape. Upper one, pretty good centering, good purse. Again, you'll see some rust stains peppered throughout. Uh, here's one that's got a pretty wide margin at the right, at the lower right. Uh, this has been sold a number of times over the years. 2012, 2020, I'm sure there's a few more. It's exchanged hands. And then I think I have one more slide to show you. Yeah, and so here are the last few that I was able to, the last one from Eric here that I think he has, uh, he might even have this one still available. Um, uh, and then the one in the middle there as well from Richard. Um, and then there's the last copy here uh, that I showed you earlier. And of course, I just, you know, I, I've left some placeholders because I am expecting a few more to turn up. Um, and speaking with Michael Aldrich only yesterday um, in an email, he's going through his past auctions and his past image archive uh, he's seen most of what I've shown you tonight, at least from the 39, and he thinks he might have a couple more that we might be able to add. So we might break 40 and we might get a little bit higher, but I don't expect to add many more. I think, you know, this will probably be the known universe uh, of what is available out there. Um, but I hope this, on this next slide, just kind of shed some light on the, the space of private di proprietary revenues how they were used, why they were used, the condition that you can most often find them in, and you are willing to accept because of the scarcity or rarity of these to at least just say you have a copy of this pretty limited issue, only canned fruit stamp that exists. And now I think you know a little bit of the history. Of course, that's what I tried to share with you. So, so and I wanna kind of wrap up here because you've been very kind to listen to me for 45 or 50 minutes. Um, there's the stamp. Again, I really, it's a, it's a beautiful stamp. Uh, it is a choice Kensit canned fruit stamp. It surfaced earlier this year after not had been seen, uh, at least by those folks that live in this space. I can tell you with confidence that Richard Friedberg and Eric Jansen and Michael Aldrich, who do a lot of work in this space and have a lot of these stamps have passed their hands that had no idea of this particular one. And so th this was hiding out for quite some time. Suffice to say, our friend Ron Lesher also knew about this and saw this, who's also giving another talk this evening, who wanted to be here but could not, because uh, I know he and I were both quite interested when this one came up earlier this year. Um, I shared a little bit with you on the history of the company, a little bit about Baltimore, the Inner Harbor, uh, you know, the oyster fields and beds, you know, down there on the Chesapeake, uh, the tin cans, uh, moving from glass to tin cans, and then being able to you know, peddle and sell their wares of oysters and fruit, and the little stamp that they put on there, uh, which was this one, you know, uh, identifying the 12 new copies was really, I was really pleased to be able to do that, get the 39, uh, and, and the acknowledgements are at the upper left, and if I've missed anybody, I apologize, but, you know, Aldrich and, and Joe Berlin, a member of our club, who I think you all know very well, 
I'm not sure if he's on tonight. I know he wanted to be. He is another match and medicine aficionado and collector. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he's, uh, he also loves this stamp, I think, as much as I do. Uh, John Bowman, Alan Bush, uh, Richard, I mentioned, uh, Bob, uh, Eric, uh, Cruz, and of course, Keith, you're with us tonight. Thank you again. And I'll put an anonymous because we have a few folks that want to remain that way who contributed to uh, some of this work. And so the call to action is pretty simple at the end. You know, if you own or have access to one or you know where there might be an image or you come across it and you want to submit one to me, hi, res, please, I'd love it. That would be great if you own one uh, and it's not represented or you think it might not be, uh, you know, feel free. Might be in the census, might not. Um, you know, I can keep it confidential if you like. Uh, I can share it, you know, and uh, that's fine. But really nice to kind of put a bow uh, on this story. Uh, and it takes me back to the beginning, and I'll go all the way back to the beginning. Really, I'll go back to the stamp. Uh, you know, uh, here is this standalone, uh, unique in the space for us, a private die proprietaries canned fruit stamp that was issued for literally less than two months uh, when the tax was in, in effect uh, in the 1860s, late 1860s. Uh, not many stamps are only around for at least issued and then, you know, it's gone within a couple of months, but this one was, it is a beautiful design. It's pretty unique in this space, beautiful color, um, short lived, and I'm really happy to share this story with you and I can stop sharing and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that anybody might have. So thanks everybody for listening. Really appreciate it. Charlie, can you show that uh, number three stamp where you detailed the, uh, the stamps out? Oh, yeah, you want to see the R3A provisional, correct? The revenue? The, the number three that you, you had. Oh, yeah, hold on a second. When you did the, that, uh, the, the whole page layout, you had. Yeah, so you want to see number three. So the montage here, number three, this one? Yeah. Oh, the, okay, uh, that was no, the third one. Yes, that is the third one that I have in the montage, and I just laid them out the same way, correct? Yeah, on, on the montage you had, I, I noticed that the, the one, I have an old Scott's uh, specialized catalog, uh, 2007, yes. but the one they show in there doesn't appear on your uh, screen because it, it's really? got a, a pretty nice diag diagonal lower left corner missing. Well, you know, Jim, you are phenomenal because that's the one place out of all the references I looked was to look in, in the old and the new Scott catalogs to see the image that they're depicting. And if it is not here, then guess what? We have found the 40th. So Jim, thank you for that. I am gonna go back <laughs> and I'm gonna check the image that Scott shows. It's funny because the stamp here, number one in black and white is the image that was on the old American Revenue article that appeared decades ago. Um, and I'm not able to match it or find the color one. So it's somewhere out there, but there, there is one there. So if you found another one, Jim, that's phenomenal. I thank you for that. I will, I will look at Scott's later on. How I missed that, could, couldn't tell you, but thank you, sir. Any other questions, please, while we have you? Charlie? Yes, sir, a, David, yes. As a medical professional, would you care to comment on the fact that early tin cans use lead solder to seal their joints? Oh, my. Um, yeah, I can comment. Very bad idea. <laughs> I, 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 that was not a good idea. So when you think you're really healthy eating those beautiful peaches, you're getting tainted. So I'm not sure. Yeah, David. So you, you know, and I know, and I think everybody knows the, the outcome of the early canned, right, industry, uh, and, and the solder and the effect that that had, right? So this, this was not a, uh, they would have been better off, let's say, using the glass, right? If they would have kept the glass, because they, they, yes. they would have been better off. So, um, Charlie, all I could think of yeah. was uh, when I had a bacteriology course was the botulism, you know, back in those days. And, and if you wonder, you know, people just throwing things in cans and sealing them. Uh, you know, what, what, what was the outcome? And it's you interesting, know, too, there's a museum. Um, Oh, somewhere that that we got i'll think of the name of the, the yes little town but they had it was a museum of an oyster museum and some of the earlier oyster shells that they got you know when they started in the 1700s were this big 
small watermelon sizes. Yes, yes. And just from the fishing and harvesting over the years, how it they declined. It has declined. Forward. But I was even surprised to see in that picture where it showed um, the piles of the shells. Yes. You know, down at the bottom of the Chesapeake, you know, they're still pretty small, even oh. then over 150 years ago. Oh, yeah, I'm showing you. I went back. You mean the oyster yeah. shells here at Crisfield? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. They're and if I big. show you this picture at the right of the factory, and this does continue off to the mm -hmm. right, there is a mountain of shells behind that little, uh, behind that fence that moves off to the right there. And you could see a tall masted ship just in the back. Again, this was right on the harbor, mm -hmm. right on the inner harbor off the of York and Light. I'm sure they use it in industry, you know, for roads or who knows what. Well, you know, this was great material, right? Isn't the, you know, let's talk about the, you know, the southern tip of Manhattan. And the landfill that was used down there, right, is the old oyster beds in, oh. in, in Brooklyn and Canarsie and, uh, and other little shorefront communities. And even off of the Isle of Manhattan, they were they used oyster shells as landfill and built buildings on top of those, right, Paul? So yeah, absolutely, yeah. there were other uses beyond that. Sure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. most definitely. I'm wondering, too, you're <clears> saying <throat> that the, even though the number's a little over a half million, which is small, yes. these kinds of issues, but that they're only in use for a couple months. I have to think that somewhere there's a file folder of these things Listen, she's you know, sitting there. As Joe and Keith and a few of other, you know, I still, you always believe that somewhere in somebody's filing cabinet somewhere is a, you know, may, maybe a few that is uh, still yet to be on, right, uh, discovered. Yeah. Um, I can tell you for a few other match of medicines um, and talking with Eric and Michael and, uh, and with Richard, who've been at this for a heck of a lot longer than me and a few others too in this field, uh, there was a find recently, two and a half months ago, down in, in North Carolina uh, of a specific medicine, no, a match stamp that there were only, I think, 12 known and 15 were discovered inside yeah. in the back of a book in one shot in one old collection from the early 1900s. So yeah. there are still <laughs> finds to be made, even in this space, which changes the dynamic of what's available to collectors and mm -hmm. you know kind of so so that i know personally because the person reached out to me do you <laughs> so know the know history what do you know the history of the stamp that you purchased uh yeah so <laughs> it's amazingly limited because i know when i purchased it from whom i purchased it and they know it came out of an old time collection that had been in the united kingdom since the early 1900s and they had no no more backstory zero no more provenance other than that Mm -hmm. That had been mm -hmm. sitting at least for a century in a book. So I mean, I, I, and they, they couldn't share anything more because they did not have any more information. Maybe Michael said he better check the Royal Collection, you know, just so, to yeah. make sure <laughs> that you have a rather good copy compared to some well, of the well, others. It's, it's funny after it was discovered. And of course, I reached out to a few of the folks that I know that are friends of mine in the UK to ask them to keep an eye out for any other M&Ms mm -hmm. <laughs> that might show up that we might not see here in this part of the world mm -hmm. to see if we can't maybe repatriate them back and bring them back and do the kind of study that I did here. So I really, in many cases, you kind of know the provenance. And in this case, it really is, it's one prior to me to then sitting in a book since the early 1900s. So wish I had more info. No, that, that's nice. Yeah. Just a small comment on uh, the uses of oyster shells. Yes. Uh, they're also uh, crushed oyster shells are used as fertilizers. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. And I, I would think with Maryland, with all the agriculture yes. there, there would have been a market for those oyster shells. Mm -hmm. You have figured it out, Bob. Thank you for that. No wonder these, uh, these lower land plains here did so well. Uh, and are sort of a hotbed for growth. Maybe even the county of Lancaster used some oyster shells shipped up from Kensett because we know about eastern Lancaster County and, uh, and the amount of agriculture that's going on in this part of the world in south central PA. So thank oh, you for sharing that. Ship, they didn't ship shells up here. They shipped oysters. They, <laughs> that, that's true. They did. And uh, the, shells, the shells are calcium carbonate yeah. and they're used to sweeten the soil. Yeah, yep, yep. So this gives us hope in this part of the world that there might be a can of unopened Kensit oysters somewhere. Uh, Mr. Silcox, when you're looking in basements and barns, you keep an eye out for a can because maybe there would be a stamp on it. You're, Joy, mute. Cur Joy, you're muted. The current Scots on this is twenty five hundred bucks. Is that yeah? Is that correct? It is yeah, it's twenty. It's a twenty twenty two 
uh, got specialized. Okay. So it's 2,500 currently and 22. Thank you yep. for that, Dennis. I wasn't sure. Okay, thank you. David, you were muted if you wanted to say something. Go ahead. I'll yes. say that unlike fine wines yeah. uh, of good vintage, I would not want to eat one of these oysters. Uh, <laughs> the Charlie, oysters you... that were found in the cans in the ship, I absolutely yeah, would not yeah, want to eat. That. Correct. Charlie, can you um, yeah. tell us what old paper means? Well, uh, yeah, well, so old paper. So, yeah, I mean, old paper, quote unquote, traditional rag stock oh, okay. stamp paper was the first type of paper that we referred to that the printers, whether it's Rod and Wright Hatch or Topin and Carpenter or even Butler and Carpenter utilized. That's called, quote unquote, traditional old paper. Okay. And the, the rag, early revenues and even early stamps were printed on, quote unquote, that batch of paper that those printing companies were able to get. Over time, they moved from typical old paper, the fibrous paper, wove, weave, you name it, laid old paper. They then, especially in the revenue era, moved to silk paper. And if you're collecting U.S. revenues, those first issue, you will see large silk fibers yep. peppered throughout the paper in the, in, the, in the fiber on the front and the back. So that would be called typically silk paper. Then you have pink paper for a short period of time uh, during this era, uh, especially in the private diaper proprietary paper, they use pink paper. It is pink, it is tinted pink. It is hard not to see that it is pink when you turn the paper over even from the face. Very limited use on a number of these stamps, a um, couple of years. They then evolved to when it moved to the BEP and the National Banknote was doing some of this printing later on, late 1870s, early 1880s they moved to traditional watermark paper, the watermark paper that we know with USIR mm -hmm. watermark on the back, Dennis. And then finally, the rarest of the rare of all of these, and in most cases, there was a few months in 1870, during the transition from old paper to what is more full silk paper, where there was a batch of paper that came into Butler and Carpenter that we term experimental silk paper. Experimental silk paper, very limited use. It is brighter, whiter, thicker, more fibrous than old paper with sometimes only one embedded blue short little silk fiber thread um, on the back, on the front. Uh, one is enough if it has all those other characteristics to be termed experimental silk. Those are uh, not common on most of these stamps. They are command a premium, they get their own catalog number, they are referred to as E. A in the catalog number is old paper. B in the Scott catalog is silk paper. C in the Scott catalog is pink paper. D in the catalog is watermark paper. And E is for experimental silk. And so they're out there. So those are the paper types that existed over the period of use of the private dye proprietaries, which adds another layer of fascination and complexity and that you would have the same stamp design printed on one type of paper up to potentially five types of paper. And, and so again, again, it just adds to the, the joy of collecting the match of medicine stamps to be able to find these different paper types. I hope that answered your question, Dennis. It did. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, Charlie yes. check your email. I just sent you three copies. Uh, <laughs> You're supposed to mail me the copies, Tom, if you actually have the stamp, but you emailed me images. So thank you, sir. Appreciate They're it. They're from Siegel, Kelleher, yep. and something called Pick Click. Okay. So I should check those against my census to see if I have them. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, Stephen Rod, thanks for joining us, sir. Look at you jumping in. Hey, Charlie DeCamo, how are you? I'm doing well, my friend. How's New York City treating you? I haven't been up there in a while. Uh, since March 2020, I've only been there once. I know, I know. <laughs> thank it's you, thank still, you. It's still there, though. I know, I know, I know. A any other questions on this uh, this little pretty little private dye canned fruit stamp? I'm happy to take them, and then we can move to you know show and tell. Charlie. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, one <clears throat> one more use of oyster shells. Yes. In San Francisco Bay, after about 50 years of. An oyster industry, the leftover shells were used by cement plants. Ah, cement, concrete, yes. Yeah. 
I did not know that. Thank you, Larry. I wonder if they built that little prison that's floating out there in the island. And uh, yeah. I think that's older. It's older, right? Okay, I'm just checking. I mean, I've been out there, but you never know. So <laughs> thank you. Hey, Charlie. Yeah, Lou. Question. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I did see, I, I thought I saw that the, the, the proprietors, they came up, they got a patent for the cans, right? Yes, that's right. I can pull. Yes, that's right. They did. Do, they, do you happen to know, Charlie, in, in your, you know, did they actually sell just cans? Did they actually just sell kids? So their separate business and they built a separate factory was to just make their tin canisters. And it's here on this slide. They built two factories. One was just for packing fruits, et cetera. And the other was just for manufacturing tins. Most of it for their own, but from the research, they also sold those as well. So they were generating revenue from a couple of different angles. That's what I One, was- right, with their, their patent for preserving food in their vessels of tin, which I mentioned here, which here is an example, in addition to then doing their own packing of their own fruits, vegetables, right. and oysters, Lou. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yep. yep. Thanks, Charlie. You're very welcome, sir. Charlie, is that image of the can, is that the top or the side of a can? Or it was one that was obviously crushed and discarded. It is crushed and it is the top from what I gathered from the research. This was the top and here it was sort of folded along the side because it was kind of, this is the flattened out piece of the top end from the other image that I was able to find. Um, if I could find another image, that would be great and it would confirm it. But this, I believe from looking at other cans of the era, era is the top of the can where they impressed or embossed in the, the manufacturing information uh, and their address, which you could see here, West Falls. Yeah, yeah, top. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll stop sharing that. It's always good to see everybody. Bob, did you have a question, sir? You're muted, Mr. Noble. You're still muted. You're I can still read muted, lips. He's, cur he's cursing me out. Let's give him three minutes no, and then no, I'll get no, to no, the no, nice no. thing. Go ahead, Bob. Sure. <laughs> um, the, um, you had pictures of the regular issue revenue stamps. Yes. Uh, being used for the usage of paying for cans, et cetera. Yes. And you made the comment that the proprietary usage of those stamps was illegal. Oh, that was only for the use of the stamp on that particular document, because they should have used the documentary stamp on that particular uh, document. Yeah, but wasn't there a that was only for a short period of time that they then allowed anything to go on anything. Yeah, that, that is true. It was short. This particular letter, I'm going to pull it back up, is dated December of 1864, Bob. So oh, oh, I'm oh. not sure at that time, and there it is, this document. Um, it's, it's interesting because it's dated 18, well, I'm sorry, 1867 is what it's dated, December of 1867. And they use this horizontal pair of one cent proprietary RC3s. Uh, it should not have, from talking with Dan, been used this way on this particular document during this time. So- Charlie, uh, what is the letter about? It, were um, they just using, if, this was something unconnected with Kensett? This no, is this, documentaries? No, no, is this that, is Kensett. This I is signed think, by Thomas Kensett. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's signed by Thomas Kensett and it's about dollars that are owed placed to your credit um, and a settlement of a bill that was dated from October. So he was looking to have a bill paid. Um, and so that's what the document refers to. And it's signed by Thomas uh, Kenzie. Okay. Yeah. But Bob, I think it's worth a little bit more research on that, at least in talking with Dan. That's kind of the, uh, the story that he told. I, now, I have not been able, not, we've not been able to find any other uh, uses. And I've been on the lookout for that double circle cancel even on off cover, I, even on off letter, off document, I would love to find another example uh, of a one set proprietary used with the Thomas Kensett double hand stamp. So if anybody has some revenues and wants to take a look, please do. Um, I would love to see those. These are also not that common. These are unused. Oh, These are in great shape. Uh, there are those two types. Mike, I think, is, is probably currently writing up uh, uh, an article on this as well, just to get these out here these hand stamps out there. Yeah. Charlie, was there a period what they, when they issued so many stamps and they realized 
they had too many out there. They didn't need all what thirty different kinds, you know, different brands of of these revenues. That was it. That they said you could use anything as long as the numbers matched. Or am I wrong? I'm, so so remind me. You mean of the of the private die proprietary? No, of this the regular revenue. The you know the first co couple issues. You know they yeah. started out with every every different you know under the sun, and then they decided this. I'm thinking, or I think I heard that you could basically use anything or... Yeah, so that, that's what Bob was alluding to. There was a period where each of these stamps, whether they proprietary or bill of lading yeah. or a, a, any other, had to be used specifically with right, right on that particular type of document. That was less than a year, though. Say that again, Bob? That was less than a year. Yeah, that was less than a year, and then they just opened it up that... You can use anything for anything. Tax. Well, did that letter fit in that open period then at the end? Uh, I'd have to go back and check yeah, where they yeah. fit in that period because that, that might explain, explain it. You know, yeah, that might explain that, Paul. That's correct. Um, that's Charlie. the first. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please, Jim. Charlie, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, that last image that you can you put up that last image that you just showed of sure. those proprietary stamps? Yeah, of course. You mean this one here? Yeah. Um, did you notice the the bottom one on the left? The word sent is upside down. It's inverted. Am I wrong? I mean, it looks like it's no, the word so, sent so, is inverted. So this stamp is turned 90 degrees to show the overprint, the hand stamp, the surcharge. Are you talking about the scent here at the bottom? That's, yeah, it looks well, like it's inverted. Well, it's not inverted. If you look at the stamp above, which is the same stamp shown in its Oh, okay, portrait. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> gotcha. right. Yeah. <laughs> Would have been oh, nice. Never mind. Oh, you know, Dennis, if, yeah. That's Who would have found a brand new invert? Uh, Charlie, uh, I yeah. want to point out about that same time, yes. I I have a lot of covers where when the mail came in to be processed, yes. Yes. Uh, companies had their own cancel stamps on it, like a receipt stamp, they stamp yes. on it. Yes. And maybe this is why you don't see this on, on other stamps. Is this, that was your own uh, received copy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, have, that's, I have a yeah, lot that, of envelopes that have a, a company like that and they just stamp it when the date it came in or yeah. something. Yeah, no, that absolutely. Well, most companies of this era absolutely had their own hand stamps that they used in a number of different ways right within their business for whatever was moving in and out. Absolutely. Um, and so clearly they had one made. Just finding this is pretty elusive to be able to have this pair with this hand stamp you know, on this particular letter. Uh, it's just a really neat find. And, uh, you know, Dan was nice enough to share it with me uh, to be able to show. And of course, we're all on the lookout for additional ones because it adds to this story. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Any other questions, thoughts? Am I crazy going down this pathway? You know, you could say that as well. No. So just Excellent presentation. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. I'm good, Paul. If everybody else is, if there's no more questions, I just want to thank everybody. And Keith, specifically, oh. you're on the line. Just again, thank you for all your help and your insight. And you've been doing this a long time as well and sharing, you know, your knowledge with me too to be able to put this together. Just thanks a lot, Keith. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Charlie. Excellent as always. We're waiting for your book with all these little chapter snippets that you've given us, the different uh, experimental papers and things. And now we'll be adding a, a nice one on uh, this RP1A. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.